All through history, people have created stories that try to answer to the cry of the heart for a fulfillment of why we're alive. And acute children's stories, there's fables, there's all these things, but they actually are all attempts to reveal what it is to be in right relationship with the Father. Because you were born to demonstrate unity between a son, a daughter, and the Father, and Him fulfilling what you were born for. Eric sent me something this last week. He said 2018 was marked with a number of recalls, all of them vegetables. <laughs> Take note that there were no bacon recalls. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> to keep your kids safe, feed them bacon. That's really, that's really the conclusion to that message. It's funny, in Weaverville, I was thinking, recalled something that happened uh, in Weaverville this morning. <clears throat> we, uh, for 11 years, while I was there, we met for 11 years at the town theater. Uh, they continued to meet there a couple more years till the building was built. But, uh, so we would put a little sandwich sign out front that said Mountain Chapel meets here today. And then on the marquee would be whatever, whatever movie was showing that week, you know. And so the newspaper captured one that you just can't, you can't miss. It was too good. It said, sandwich sign, Mountain Chapel meets here today. On the marquee it said, gods must be crazy. <laughs> Which I thought was a perfect combination. I don't know, I just, I, I, it witnessed to my heart that it was good. All right, a woman just returned to her home from an evening of church services when she was startled by an intruder. She caught the man in the act of robbing her home and its valuables, and she yelled, stop, Acts 2.38. That verse says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven. The burglar stopped in his tracks. <clears throat> the woman call, calmly called the police, explained what she had done. As the officer cuffed the man to take him in, he asked the burglar, why did you just stand there? All the old lady did was yell a scripture to you. He replied, scripture? She said she had an ax and two 38s. <laughs> okay, let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. We have a, a real a special treat. One of our heroes of the faith, uh, the healing revival of the 50s is Jack Coe, and his son, Jack Coe Jr., is here today, and grandson, Jared. Are, are you able to wave at us or something? Let everybody know where you are. And so Jared, uh, Jack Jr.'s grandson is here. We're just uh, wonderful friends. We're honored that you'd be here. Um, for two weeks, the last two times I've spoken to you, I've talked to you about bitterness and jealousy, which are just wonderful Christmas themes, and... Uh, I, I, I had to interject throughout the messages, Merry Christmas, just to keep people from falling into deep depression. And uh, that seriously, if, if uh, you weren't able to be a part of those days, I would encourage you to review that. Today, I want to look at uh, one part of the Christmas story that always impacts me. The only thing I don't like about Christmas is that we, we tend to look at scriptures or sing songs that we only do like one time a year. And these are, for the believer, these themes are continuous throughout the year. And Mary is one of the great heroes of Scripture. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about her, and I'm because I'm, in, I'm inspired by her, her, um, her example, the way she responded to an impossible uh, challenge in front of her. So we'll look at that in a moment. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, natural, spiritual, Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she revealed Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon the written word and Jesus is revealed. The Holy Spirit comes upon a surrendered believer and Jesus is revealed. I don't at all want to lessen the significance of the role that Mary Place. She's called highly favored of the Lord. So please don't misunderstand that. However, 
the miracle of Jesus being manifest in and through you, me, you and me is the same miracle. It's the Spirit of God coming upon the natural to manifest the eternal. Eternity is the cornerstone of all logic and reason. Anytime we lose sight of eternity, we are bound to come to temporary and false conclusions. It's seeing things from an eternal perspective that changes everything. For example, Mary is called highly favored of the Lord. If you lose sight of eternal perspective, you look at her circumstances. Joseph wants to divorce her, not follow through with the wedding. Herod wants to kill her kid, her son. The, the uh, scandal of her being a mother of an illegitimate child looks like anything but favor. Favor on your life will reveal issues in the people around you. And our ability to carry favor well is key to the increase of favor. We never owe anyone an explanation, nor should you ever apologize for favor. Apology of favor is an expression of unbelief that basically says God made a bad decision by giving me favor. You never want to dishonor God with, with how unqualified you may feel with foreign assignment. I hope everybody in the room feels unqualified. If you feel qualified, you haven't seen your assignment. <laughs> if, if you feel qualified, you don't see it clearly because the only, the only possible response from seeing what God expects from our life is the overwhelming sense, I could never pull this off. And that's the position that the Lord puts every one of us in so that he can demonstrate who he is. Good works are a critical part of the Christian life. Uh, feeding uh, the poor, serving those with out, uh, clothes or housing or whatever it might be, fill in the blanks. The, the, the overall gamut of meeting uh, the demand of human need is a huge part of, of the Christian life. But if we're honest, we'll realize that feeding the poor and all these other amazing and wonderful things can be done by people who don't know the Lord. There has to be an aspect of our service before the Lord that only he can do in and through us. It has to cross the line into the realm of impossibility or it has not adequately given witness to the resurrection of Jesus. There is in every one of us an inbuilt appetite for the impossible that it would bend its knee to the name Jesus through our lips. It's critical, it's vital, that that is a regular part of our life. If it is not, we have to come back before the Lord and find out why. Not introspection, but to learn where do I take risk, where do I partner. The Lord is looking for people who will come into agreement with what he has said. There's an alignment, I I almost hate to use the word alignment because cults use it, but we're called a cult, so maybe it's all right. I don't know. <laughs> there's this agreement, there's this alignment we make with the Lord that God declares a matter when people come into proper alignment or agreement with what he has said, there is the display of what God intends on the earth. Let's take a look at these scriptures, and then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take some time to talk through, it's about 12 verses, we'll take probably 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time sharing in communion together. And uh, I, uh, it's going to be two completely separate parts, but they'll both be good, I hope. All right, let's go to verse 26. Did I tell you where, Luke? Luke chapter 1, did I not tell you where? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it's in, open your Bible anywhere. It's all good. Let's just start, start reading out loud wherever you open to, and we'll just see how well this works. All right. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, uh, we're going to do about 12 verses, for, so just uh, follow hard. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth 
to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Last two verses. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I love this story a lot. I actually will return. This is one of the places that I will sometimes return to just to be refreshed in reading something that's out of my sequence. I I like to read books of the Bible and just go through them, but every once in a while I'll just go right to this and just plow, read through this because it's, it's so encouraging to me. <clears throat> Mary has an angel show up and make this announcement of God's intention. And everything that God has intended to do in and through you is absolutely impossible, as I've already stated. If you're not overwhelmed by your assignment, you don't see your assignment. What he intends to do is absolutely impossible. It's to put us into the place of absolute dependency so that he can work in and through us to display himself as the God of the impossible. That is his intention. And he has designed it so for every person who puts their faith in Christ. It is not for a select few. It is the design of God for every person. So the angel shows up to Mary and he says, rejoice, highly favored one. Typically, you rejoice after the baby is born. She would commanded, rejoice, it's coming. There's not one situation that anybody in this room faces that you wouldn't like to have a miracle for, that Jesus has not already settled the issue, paid the appropriate price so that that miracle could be accomplished in his name. There's not one situation. He did not pay for the car, so you and I would leave it on the lot. Everything in our life has already been settled. The cross that Jesus suffered on was that complete in its effect and in its work. There's not one thing anybody in this room could face that Jesus would look at and say, ah, oh, Wish I would have thought of that before I died. I would have put that on the cross too, you know. There's, there's none of those things. Every single issue of life, in fact, not just in this life, but all throughout all of eternity, has already been settled. So when the angel of the Lord comes to Mary and says, rejoice, highly favored one, it is because this thing has already been settled in heaven. If we knew how much was already settled in heaven, joy would be the natural response. Celebration beforehand. Because the reality is eternity defines every situation we face. I may be in the middle of a conflict here, but I'm also in the middle of a breakthrough here. I may be in the middle, I hope, in the middle of a challenge here because it's necessary for faith to grow. But I'm also experiencing great breakthrough here. Every person in this room was designed to invade this realm called impossibility. And now the Lord, this angel of the Lord appears to Mary and says, rejoice, highly favored one. This favor would cause her to be valued and celebrated for all of eternity. Everywhere the gospel is shared, there is celebration for this woman who said yes, and the miracle produced Jesus. She is celebrated. 
but she was also opposed. And favor does that to our surroundings. I, I exhort strongly, do not make excuses for the favor of God. Simply embrace it and give him the honor and the credit for it. I, I've shared this even in recent weeks, but you know the, the whole point is, is when somebody comes to you and they celebrate you and they thank you and they tell you you did such a great job, please don't say it wasn't me, it was Jesus. Because, uh, uh, you know... Besides it being nauseating for the rest of us, I, I come to somebody and I say, it's a beautiful song you just sang. They tell me, oh, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. I'm thinking, yeah, it wasn't that good. It was, it, was, it was good. It was good. But let's be honest, if Jesus sang that, universes would be created, you know. If, if it just his declared word would have just changed everything. So it wasn't that, it was good, but it wasn't that good. When, when someone comes to you with a compliment, receive it. If, if you don't know how to receive honor, you'll have no crown to throw at his feet. You have to know how to receive honor. Then when you get alone with the Lord, you just say, look what was given to me that belongs to you. It's a part of the process. So back to the story. Mary is called this highly favored one, and she had both blessing and challenges because of the favor, and favor will do that. I, uh, the subject of favor is not our subject today, so I've got to go quick on this, but a favor is, um, favor is the difference between some people fulfilling why they're alive and others who don't, the issue of favor. People can have a call of God on their life, but never learn the need for favor. And so they never increase in favor and thus never have the appropriate open doors, the support, whatever is needed to be able to accomplish what God has called them to do. Favor is the issue. It says of Jesus, he increased in favor with God and with man. It's amazing. I understand why he needs to increase in favor with man. Because it's going to be Zacchaeus that welcomes him into his home. It's going to be, it's going to be the Pharisee that invites him, you know, to his house to where uh, Mary washes his feet. It's going to be these people that give opportunity for Jesus to step in. But how is it that Jesus, the Son of God, who is absolutely perfect in every possible way, how is it he has to increase in favor with God? And I don't know. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I just know if he did, ooh. You and I might want to consider our need for increased favor with God as well. And uh, don't think that what you have is enough because part of what you need is what you can obtain through faithfulness with what you have. So we'll leave that there. Let's move on down to this uh, verse 32. It says in the last half of the verse, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's strange because in verse uh, 35, it says he will be called the son of God, but in verse 32, he's called the son of David. <clears throat> These, this is one of the things that has, has marked me, is to see God, look at this man, David, who God said he has a heart after my heart. The Lord looked at this man, David, and said, I'm going to call my son your son forever. How do you obtain such a place of favor with the Almighty God? It, it tells me he's impressionable. It tells me it's possible to, to leave a mark on his heart. He's not this robotic being. He's one who has invited us into this relational journey. And we've got times in Scripture where <clears throat> someone would demonstrate faith. The centurion demonstrates faith. The Syrophoenician woman, they demonstrate this faith. And Jesus stops in the middle of the miracle. He says, I've not seen faith like this in all of Israel. How is it that you have God stand up and go, wow, look at that. I've never seen anything like that before. See, there are certain responses that the people of God can have to him 
that's not generic. It's not apathetic. It's unique. It's honest. It's real. It's absolute surrender. And he stops and he says, you know what? I'm going to call my son your son. Never have I seen such great faith in all of Israel's history. This is a relational journey. This is not a Christian routine where you jump through hoops and try to accomplish a certain regiment. I've been invited to know God. And in my heart of hearts, knowing him is the reason I'm alive. It's the reason I wake up in the morning. It's the reason I go to bed at night. It's the reason behind everything is this invitation to actually walk with the one who created all things and to come to know him. And there's something about this privileged invitation that makes everything else pale in comparison. I remember talking to some young people years ago. I was in this group of about 20 or so, and I said, the claims of Jesus are so absolutely astronomical, so extreme, that if it is true, I owe him my entire life to that which is true. But if it is a lie, it has made such a mark on history that I, into, I owe him my, or owe my entire life to humanity to disprove that this thing that he has claimed is true. In other words, it is a line in the sand that says, choose your side. It is that demanding. It is not gray. It's not a gray area. It's not an apathetic area. It's not an area that we stand back and simply applaud. It's like the claims of this Jesus to actually atone for sin, to make it to where I can have peace forever with God, where his nature can become my own nature, that I am actually changed from the inside out, that I find out why I'm alive. Suddenly, this becomes crystal clear, and it becomes clear through the redemptive work of Jesus. And here in this moment, he's called the Son of God, but he's also called the Son of David. Move down to verse 37. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite verses. The next two are two of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Verse 37 says, For with God nothing will be impossible. Say that with me. With God nothing will be impossible. Say it again. For with God nothing will be impossible. We've looked at this, oh goodness, countless times through the years, and I realize for many of you this will be repeat, but I love repeating it. With God nothing will will be impossible. That phrase, nothing will be impossible, has interesting makeup. And it was Jack Taylor who uh, helped me to understand this many years ago. I actually heard him teach on this passage before I ever met him. He has since become a personal friend and a friend of our house and writes me regularly just to encourage me. He's such a, an amazing father in the faith. But he took this verse, nothing is impossible with God, and he broke it down, and this is how it's broken down. The word nothing is actually two different words. It's the word no, but then it's the word rhema. Rhema is the, there's logos and rhema in, in, the, in the Greek language to describe God's word. Logos would be more used for the written word. Rhema is that which is freshly spoken. It's not absolute, but those are, those are uh, the way that it's predominantly used in the Scripture. So just think through this with me. Rhema, no rhema, no freshly spoken word of God will be impossible. The word impossible actually means without ability. And so this verse can be translated this way. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. Wow. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. See, in James 1, it says, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. The power is not in my ability to receive. The power is in the word I receive. In the same way, the... the acorn produces the oak tree, the power's in the acorn. The surroundings, the soil is my amen to what God is saying. 
It is my surrender. It is my yieldedness to that which God has spoken. I have a role, but I don't make anything grow. I create the atmosphere of absolute surrender so that his purposes can actually be fully displayed in me into any measure he intends. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to any one of us that does not in itself contain its own ability to make sure that what was spoken actually happens. And that's why the next verse is so significant. Verse 38, Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. We used to sing this song years ago, <clears throat> Be it unto me according to your word. And it was this wonderful song. Dick Joyce, in fact, taught us, who is home with the Lord now, but a wonderful prophet friend that made such a huge difference <clears throat> in our lives in Weaverville and here at Bethel. But he taught us this song. I'll never forget it. Be it unto me according to your word. We would just sing this song where we're using scripture to sing into this place of absolute surrender. God, we want you to perform in and through us all that you intend. Now catch this thought. Jesus, oh, I almost walked on water. Jesus, <laughs> or air, either one, air or water, same thing, same thing. Jesus, in the gospel of John, the predominant feature of the Gospel of John is that Jesus came to reveal the Father. Yes? Yeah. Ten of you agree? Yeah. Anybody ever read the Gospel of John? <laughs> Jesus came to reveal the Father. Yeah. You know, if I keep at it, by the end of the day, we should have everyone. <clears throat> Okay, Jesus came to reveal the Father. Here's the deal. The Father is only revealed through his children. In other words, he can be revealed, but not as Father. He can be re revealed as Almighty God. He can be revealed as the great judge. He can be revealed as the creator. He can be revealed as a thousand different things. But if he's revealed as the Father, it's in connection to the revelation of of who his kids are. The point I want to make is, is that you and I have this incredible privilege to reveal the Father by us being what he has designed us to be. In, in other words, if, if, if I claim to be a good father, then it has to be measurable with how my children are treated. Yes? Your relationship with God as your father actually illustrates the quality of his fathering. And Jesus illustrated that very thing perfectly by doing what? He only said what he heard his father say. He only did what he saw his father do. He illustrated perfectly. You go to a place in Rome and you throw a coin into the fountain and you make a wish. Your birthday cake is brought to you and you blow out the candles and you make a wish. In the child's story, you rub on a lantern and a genie comes out and you make a wish. All through history, people have created stories that try to answer to the cry of the heart for a fulfillment of why we're alive. And acute children's stories, there's fables, there's all these things. I'm fine with all of them as stories. But they actually are all attempts to reveal what it is to be in right relationship with the Father because you were born to demonstrate unity between a son, a daughter, and the father, and him fulfilling what you were born for. And so she says, be it unto me, according to your word. That's the amen. I can't make that impossibility happen. How many of you are aware, you cannot make 
what God wants out of your life. You can't make it happen. But what I can do is I can say yes. What I can do is invite him to do what only he can do. So say this with me. Be it unto me, be it unto me. according to your word. We're going to share in communion together, and uh, I would like to ask for our ushers and usherettes and whoever's helping to, uh, to hand out the supplies. We're going to share in communion together. We're not going to have you, typically our tradition is, come to the front, we share in communion in groups, and we're not going to do that today because I want to lead you through specific uh, things. I do want to ask uh, staff and ministry team, come on up to the front if you would, because I want to have you ready when we're through with communion, I want to have you ready to pray for people. For those who are watching on Bethel TV, we should announce ahead of time that we're doing communion so you can get your own supplies ready and join with us. So if that's doable, do it quickly because uh, we'd love to have you join. I want to take you through a uh, typical normal process of communion for my wife, for myself. <clears throat> By the way, uh, Benny and I, mostly Benny, uh, wrote a book on communion that comes out in February. And uh, so I'm real, real excited. Uh, for this. It's going to be a great, I think, a great uh, compliment to what God's doing in the earth. <clears throat> As a believer, I don't come, if you can pass the elements and, and give me your attention, that'll be a great miracle. As a believer, I don't come to this table of the Lord as a tradition where I need to just get another notch on my Bible that I've accomplished something that I'm supposed to do. For me, this is a living interaction between me and the Almighty God. It's one of the most history-influencing activities of my life. It's not done out of routine. It's done with faith. It's done with obedience. I know as Protestants, we're not supposed to approach the body, this, the blood and the bread this way. But when I hold the bread in my hand, I remind myself, Jesus said, this is my body. I don't have to understand anything about it. All I need to do is acknowledge. I hold in my hand the broken body of Jesus. The broken body represents something to us that's extremely significant. Jesus was beat with a whip. If you can imagine a whip with leather strands and on the end would be pieces of shards of glass and pieces of metal. And they beat him with this whip until history tells us internal organs were displayed. He was, he was beyond recognition. And according to Isaiah 53, that payment that he made was not so that we would feel bad for him looking in the past, but that we would realize he purchased something in that moment. He actually bought your right to healing. He made a payment. By his stripes, I was healed, is the scripture. By his stripes, I was healed. 2,000 years ago, a payment was made for our healing. And the only thing greater than divine healing is divine health. And I believe that the Lord's going to give us insight. I, I don't have it right now. I just, I just have the ache in my heart. I can tell when God's doing something because my heart will usually ache for it first. There's this ache in my heart that tells me there is a reality I've not yet tasted of that he has made available. And I don't know how to get there except to come before him repeatedly in obedience and surrender making my petitions known. And that issue is divine health. I believe that if Israel, in the wilderness, in rebellion against God, 
not even born again, could experience divine help, then how much more those who are under superior covenant would actually taste of superior blessings. What I don't want us to do ever is to create a theology for a problem we face. Only hold to the theology of the solution. Only hold to the theology that says, this is what Jesus has accomplished, that this that I'm facing would yield and be broken for the glory of God. You hold in your hands the testimony of a broken body. I want you to stand. I, there may be some in the back that don't yet have the bread, but I want you to stand. I want you to hold your bread out in front of you. And there are several things that I do that I'm going to ask you to do with me, to put everything else aside, all, all, all other activities. In this one moment, I want us to come before the Lord with the broken body of Jesus. And what I like to do, I did it this morning. I didn't realize we were having communion today, so I brought my own communion stuff to the office. I come down here early and just pray to get ready for the day. And I was walking through the sanctuary. I did this again. I held the bread, the body before the Lord and began to pray and make confession, declaration. By the stripes of Jesus, Mary is healed. Cancer is never to return to her body again. By the stripes of Jesus, Parkinson's is gone from Kathy. Parkinson's has been defeated in Allen. And just make these declarations. They're not ritual or routine. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And all I want is my tongue to agree with what God has accomplished and with what God is saying. So I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to take just a moment, hold the bread before the Lord, and just declare the healing grace of Jesus over your own body, over your family, over any family member or person, friend, that you know that's battling a disease. Bring their name before the Lord and declare over them, by his stripes you were healed. Let's do that. Take just a moment for that. Do that even at home, those of you who are watching. By the stripes of Jesus. By the stripes of Jesus, I was made whole. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. By the stripes of Jesus, Mark Cooper was healed. Cancer is never to return to that body. By the stripes of Jesus, even in this room, brain disorders are to be healed. This is spirit, soul, and body. Every area of life healed. There's not one thing he left out. We declare that healing grace. Now, hold that bread in front of you again. When you're on your own, obviously you can pray for everybody you can think of, uh, but we do have a time limit this morning. So hold that bread in front of you. Here's another thing that the broken body of Jesus did. In Ephesians 2, it says, Jesus bore on his body the dividing wall. Now think about it. Between Jew and Gentile, the greatest divide ever to exist, the blessed and the cursed. Jesus took on his own body the dividing wall. What does that mean? It means that this bread, this brokenness that you hold in your hand, he became broken that we might become whole. He became empty that we might become full. He became despised so that we could be celebrated. He was rejected so we could be accepted. He became this so that we could live in this. This is what God intended for you and me. Any situation where you know there's division, it could be between you and a family member. It could be between a racial conflict in, in uh, your place of work or, or city or nation. It doesn't matter what it is. I want you to hold this before the Lord, and I want you to make the confession, this is more than enough to fix this divide. This is more than enough. The payment you made is more than adequate to make it possible for unity to exist between this church and that church, this race and that race, this family and that family. Lord God, we give you thanks for the power of healing and the power of unity. All that was released through the broken body of Jesus. Receive that now. Let's partake together. Now we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. Hold the cup before the Lord. When I bring the cup before the Lord, 
Jesus said that this is his blood. There's two confessions I like to make, proclamations I like to make when I partake of communion of the blood. The first is, the blood of Jesus sets me free. Say that with me. The blood of Jesus sets me free. Say it again. The blood of Jesus. One more time. The blood of Jesus sets me free. <clears throat> the other thing I like to proclaim as I pray for every fam- member of my family, every member, as I make this confession, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say it together. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then I pray for members of my family. Do that now. Take just maybe 60 seconds for that. Just declare. If you have loved ones that aren't walking with the Lord, just call them in. We just say every single one has a place in Christ. We call them home in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus sets free. The blood of Jesus sets free. Every single family member. The blood of Jesus sets free. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. I love praying for my family so much. I love, I just love, what I do is I pray for my kids, my grandkids, as I've done for, goodness, 40, Eric's 42 years old, so I've done it for 42. In fact, I did it before he was born. I pray, God, Jeremiah 24, God, give them a heart to know you. Let them hear your voice. Woo them with your voice. Let them know your ways. God, let them know your ways. Pray that for your family. God, give them a heart to know you. Let them know your ways, God. Draw them near to you. Next to praying for my family, probably my most favorite part is when I pray for those who have, for whatever reason, have chosen to oppose me or criticize me uh, their, their, work, their work in the gospel is to somehow take away from whatever God is doing here. And um, the Bible makes it clear you don't ever have the right to criticize a servant to their master. So I have, I have no voice before the Lord. I don't want to anyway, but I have no voice to criticize another servant of God to God himself. What I have found joy in is praying for God to abundantly bless them in every possible way. I love to pray that God would prosper them, spirit, soul, and body, that their health would be good, that he would, they would never need anything financially, that God would surround them with favor, that every opportunity for their gift would be provided for them, that they would become all that God has meant for them to become. I love to pray that when I'm holding the cup of the blood because the blood is what covers me and covers them. It's the blood that wipes out the power of sin. And I love to pray... Uh, my favorite thing, I guess, maybe, is, is that I pray that God would give their children and their grandchildren, that they would know the joy of having children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren that serve God with a whole heart, absolute passion, absolute purity of heart, that they would know the joy of multiple generations serving Jesus. Some of you have, you're in conflict right now. You may be doing well, but it's, there's just the pain of conflict. I want you to pray blessing on that person. If the person you need to forgive is already dead, don't pray for them. We don't pray for the dead. But honestly, pray for their family members, their descendants. Pray that the Lord would so richly touch that household, that family that remains from that person who caused you such pain. Be a redemptive person, not just a reactor. Be a redemptive person. So let's hold this cup before the Lord. Let's pray this one thing. If you have anyone you need to forgive, obviously, just do it right now. I just declare forgiveness for that person. Mention their name. Pray for the Lord to just so prosper these people. I think the the ones that I know of are doing all that they know to do with what they have. I can't judge them by my experience. So I bless them. I ask for rich, rich reward of God on their lives. I release them from my judgment. The file of information I've collected that proves me right and them wrong, I throw it on the fire right now and I declare 
the wonderful grace of Jesus covers us both. Amen to that? Let's receive this together as a testimony of our own forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Wow. I mean, do we have ushers and, yeah, you got little baggies. Pass the cups to the aisle if you would. Otherwise, we're going to have broken shards of plastic all over the room. I need to do one more thing as we get ready to go. We've got ministry team down here. Is anybody else thankful that we've got a team of people just ready to pray? Service. So thankful. Okay, we've got a lot of movement here. Let it be just the ushers taking care of stuff. The rest of you could just give me your attention for a moment here. I should have done this before we took communion. I apologize. It's really out of sequence. But let me just ask the question. If there's anyone here that would say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building until I, I know I am at peace with God, until I know I've been forgiven, until I know that I've been born again, changed from the inside out, I want to follow Jesus with all of my heart. If there's anybody in that position, put a hand up right now. Just say, Bill, that's me. I don't want to leave the building until I know I'm right with God. One way back over here. Yeah, beautiful. Anybody else? Put your hand up high. There's another one right over here. It's wonderful. Greatest miracle of all is this right here. Yep. Anyone else? Real quick. Here's what I'm going to ask. Who's, who's uh, helping me out here? You're, okay, Tom, come on up. Here's what I want to ask. The two of you that just raised your hand, if there's more that I missed, uh, just come on down. I want you to come right over here to my left. I've got some people over here, friends that we know and trust. I want to ask them to talk with you and just pray with you. I want to make sure that what happens in your life, that what you raised your hand for actually happens in your life. So I want to ask you, come down to the front over here and back over here. Come down to the front. These people with their hands up, they will talk with you and pray with you. Those of you that need a miracle in your body, you can start to make your way now. And then uh, Tom's just going to wrap this up.